Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another lecture. We are discussing hemostasis uh, in this video. So we're still going through all the major platelet and coagulation disorders. Now this is probably some of the high yield topics for any examination. Okay, so if you look at normal hemostasis or the way the body works to bring about clotting of blood, it's an interplay between the vasculature, the platelets, and the coagulation pathway. Now, to really understand these uh, disorders, so you have to first understand the coagulation cascade, which uh, is basically divided into an intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. So intrinsic is when uh, there's some sort of a damaged surface, uh, like a damaged blood vessels, or an extrinsic where there is an external trauma. So the extrinsic pathway um, is by activation of factor 7 to 7a and which then activates factor 10 and um, which is further cleaved by factor 5a and then prothrombin to thrombin formation happens. So this is where the pathway differs and if you look at the intrinsic pathway here, the damaged surface causes an activation of factor 12 which leads to activation of factor 11 then factor 9 and then factor 8 converts factor 9 to factor 10 and from there on the two pathways are common so prothrombin is converted to thrombin and fibrinogen is converted to fibrin and then you have uh, factor 13 which forms a cross-linked fibrin clot okay um, so this is the main coagulation pathway or the coagulation cascade uh, as it is known as uh, as well which brings about hemostasis okay uh, now as we've discussed a spasm in a damaged muscle pathway uh, is what initiates all this and, and then you activate the platelets as well to bring about the aggregation and now depending upon the insult it could be an intrinsic or an extrinsic uh, activation and ultimately you form a clot which uh, is finally retracted and uh, the clot is ultimately destroyed. Okay, so if you look at extrinsic pathway, as we said, is mediated by tissue factors. Uh, it causes rapid response and you can um, see it as a prolonged prothrombin time. It involves factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. Uh, it's vitamin K dependent pathway. So these are also known as vitamin K dependent factors. So you can have a question where they say, you know, which are the vitamin K dependent factors or which of these, for example, is a uh, uh, vitamin K dependent factor. So you have to remember 2, 7, 9 and 10. Okay. So inhibition of vitamin K can be done by warfarin. Now when you look at intrinsic pathway, it is mediated by surface contact factors. As compared to an extrinsic pathway, this pathway is a slow responder. And in this pathway, uh, activation of this pathway, you can see uh, ac increased APTT, so which is different from an increased PT in the extrinsic pathway. Now this involves factors 8, 9 and 11 so we we saw that it was 2 7 9 and 10 for the extrinsic but this for the intrinsic it's factor 8 9 and 11 okay and this accounts for 99 percent of uh, inherited bleeding disorder so hemophilia a hemophilia b and hemophilia c and hemophilia a is factor 8 deficiency b is factor 9 deficiency and c is factor 11 deficiency now all these can be your multiple choice questions or simple question you could be asked in a viva choice so common pathway uh, will see both pt and aptt as prolonged thrombin and fibrinogen form an insoluble clot which causes stoppage of bleeding okay we also need to know about platelets okay so normal platelet count is kind of considered between 1.5 to 4.0 so 150,000 to 400,000 cubic millimeter less than 100,000 is what we classify as thrombocytopenia now if it's less than 50,000 there's a risk and if it's less than 20,000, transfusion is usually required. And if it's less than 10,000, then it may cause spontaneous hemorrhage. Platelet dysfunction. 
uh, will result in mucous membrane bleeding like epistaxis, gingival bleeding, vaginal bleeding or tecal bleeding. This is one of the examples of a patient presenting with a platelet deficiency. Another example of a similar disorder. Now, platelet disorders can be multiple types. So you can have uh, ITP as it's commonly known as or idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura or a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. You can also have a hemolytic uremic syndrome or a heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Now, drug induced inactivation of platelets can also happen. Now, immune thrombocytopenic uh, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, my, uh, my apologies, is also an acquired autoimmune disorder. Uh, now this is a disorder with a normal bone marrow. Uh, acute form or a chronic form can be found. In the acute form, it's common in a children two to six years old and it's usually associated with a prior viral illness within three weeks of the onset. It's self-resolving and settles down in one to two months and in 90% patients, it usually just settles down. It's, it's kind of a benign disease chronic form adults uh, women more than men so the chronic form is more in adults as compared to the acute form which we saw is in children two to six years old uh, it's associated with autoimmune disorders like sle or hiv uh, as compared to the acute form its resolution is rare and it's usually associated with very low platelets of less than twenty thousand. it's commonly associated with mucosal bleeding it's one of the common clinical manifestations of ITP or immune thrombocytopenic purpura. The management uh, main thing is do not transfuse platelets. Steroids are required. Some of the patients may need splenectomy. Immunoglobulin therapy is quite useful and some patients who are not recovering may need plasma pheresis. So this is all about immunothrombocytopenic purpura. We have to know it in depth. Uh, the major features are especially something that you should all be aware about. Now the next one is a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So it's as the name says, it's thrombocytopenia with a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. It's a pentad of fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal failure and neurological symptoms. Uh, associated Problems include AIDS, lupus, scleroderma, Jogren syndrome. So all these conditions can present with thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, even in pregnancy. Treatment is by cyclosporine, tacrolimus, and quinidine. Lab findings include schistocytes, which are also called as helmet cells. Platelets are less than 20,000. Reticulocyte count is increased. Indirect bilirubin is increased because of these are all findings of hemolytic anemia. So we should know these by heart. Increased lactate dehydrogenase and decreased haptoglobulin. Treatment is by an urgent hematology consult, plasma pheresis, and steroids. So let's have a look at a peripheral smear of intravascular hemolysis showing a schistocyte as we can see where the arrow is pointing and similar picture in another patient. So this is all about thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And the next one is hemolytic uremic syndrome, where um, in association with thrombocytopenia and a hemolytic anemia, we also have a renal failure. It's usually seen in children six months to four years. And it's the most common cause of acute renal failure in children associated with E. coli H7057, which is also known as a Shiga-like toxin. Presentation is in the form of bloody diarrhea and seizures, uh, associated with a pentad of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Neurological symptoms are more pronounced in TTP, whereas renal dysfunction is more pronounced in hemolytic uremic syndrome. So those are the two differentiating features of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and a hemolytic uremic syndrome. Lab findings obviously show schistocytes. Lab findings of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Worse renal function parameters uh, are commonly f a feature of hemolytic uremic syndrome with renal failure. Treatment is supportive with dialysis and we should not give antibiotics. So 
Easy way to remember if you see schistocytes on peripheral smear in a child, it's likely to be a hemolytic uremic syndrome. And if you see schistocytes in an adult, it's a thrombocytic thrombocytopenic purpura. Also, if you see schistocytes with neurological dysfunction, it's a TTP. And if you see schistocytes with a renal dysfunction, it's a uremic syndrome. So this is all about hemolytic uremic syndrome. Now we're going to discuss about heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Um, it's of two types, so type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is seen in a lot of patients. Platelet count in these patients is less than 100,000. Usually happens with first few days. It's benign and it's not associated with thrombosis. Platelet count normalizes regardless of heparin use or disuse. Type 2 is autoimmune and consumptive, occurs day 4 to 14, one third of the cases associated with thrombosis. Must stop heparin, no low, no low molecular weight heparins should be used, no platelet transfusions should be given unless if it's a life threatening bleeding. Treatment is with direct thrombin inhibitors like heroin, leporidin and ergotroban. And the drug-induced inactivation of platelets can also happen. Most common is quinidine, sulfonamides, phenytoin, etc. Less common can happen with chronic alcohol use, NSAIDs, and valproic acid. Now, this could be because of development of antiplatelet antibodies, and treatment is usually pretty good. Uh, recovery happens within one week. Steroids may be required. Desmopressin or platelet transfusion if they have severe hemorrhage. So this is uh, in a nutshell about platelet disorders. Now let's have a look at some important coagulation disorders, namely hemophilia A, B, a disseminated intravascular coagulation, von Willebrand's disease and medication toxicity, which can lead to coagulation problems. Okay, so hemophilia A is also called as classic hemophilia. First thing we need to know is because of factor 8 deficiency. So what causes hemophilia A? is factor 8 deficiency. It's an X-linked recessive disorder. Uh, spontaneous genetic mutations occur and which account for one third of new cases. Severity is dependent upon factor 8 deficiency. Now it's, uh, now it's classified as mild, moderate and severe. So let's have a look. So severe is when there is spontaneous bleeding and in these patients factor 8 is less than 1%. Now, moderate is when there is occasional spontaneous bleeding, but more commonly follows trauma or surgery. Factor 8 is 1 to 5% in these patients. Mild is when there's occasional hemorrhage, like after major procedures like dental extractions, and factor 8 is more than 5%. 90 percent of the bleeding events involve joints like the knee. Uh, intramuscular neurovascular compromise can happen. Bleeding manifestations can be delayed for hours, though it's normally seen within eight hours. Myelin lacerations and abrasions are not problematic. Head injuries are treated without waiting for a CT scan. Should always, always believe the patient. So if the patient tells you that you know he's had an issue with coagulopathy in the past, you should take his word and investigate accordingly. The lab findings are important in hemophilia A. PTT is increased unless 30% of the factor activity is present. Specific factor S's are very, very necessary in these patients as inhibitor may be present in 10 to 25% of patients and they may have antibodies against factor 8. So treatment is basically because there's a factor 8 deficiency, you need to give them factor 8. So it's a therapy of choice. Um, each factor 8 unit per kilogram increases the factor 8 by 2%. So that's something we should know about. Factor 8 concentrate can be obtained from pooled donors. However, there's a risk of infection. Now major life-threatening conditions may need 50 international units per kilogram initially. In muscle bleeding or hemarthrosis, they may be given 25 to 50. Minor bleeding, the dosage requirements are usually 12.5 to 25 international units per kilogram. Now, desmopressin may also be used in mild to moderate disease, which stimulates the increase of factor by three to five folds.
you know, fresh frozen plasma may also be used and cryoprecipitate may also be used. Fresh frozen plasma and cryoprecipitate should be used as a tempering measures if recombinant or concentrate factor 8 is not available. Should always consult a hematologist on board early to direct treatment choices and dosing. So that's all about hemophilia A. Now hemophilia B is also known as Christmas disease. It's also an X-linked recessive bleeding disorder due to deficiency of factor 9 functions. So factor 8 is hemophilia A. Factor 9 deficiency is hemophilia B. Clinical presentation is same as hemophilia A. And some of these patients can also have an inhibitor to factor 9, which is in about less than 2% patients. Now treatment is similar to factor 8 deficiency. So because hemophilia B is a factor 9 deficiency, we have to give them factor 9 concentrates. Both factor products increase the factor 9 by 1% for each international units per kilogram of factor 9 that we give. Now fresh frozen plasma cryopsipitrate can also be given. However, desmopressin is not ineffective in these patients. Now cryoprecipitate can only be used in factor 8 deficiency. Cryoprecipitate does not have factor 9, something we should know about. Okay, so no factor 9 in cryoprecipitate, so cryoprecipitate should not be used in hemophilia B. Okay, next topic is disseminated intravascular coagulation, commonly known as DIC. Now, it is a consumptive coagulopathy. It's a hemostasis which has gone wild. There's a simultaneous coagulation and fibrinolytic pathways promoting both bleeding and thrombotic components. One of them predominates usually. Most common causes include infection, especially gram-negative sepsis. Cancers and leukemias can also cause disseminated intravascular coagulation. Trauma, hepatic diseases, pregnancy, acute respiratory disease syndrome, viper venom, transfusion reactions can all lead to DIC. If we do hematological studies in these patients, PT is elevated. Often PTT is also elevated. Uh, you'll also find decreased platelets and fibrinogen. Increased fibrin split products and D dimers are seen, and fragmented RBCs and anemia are common. Treatment is first by IV fluids and blood transfusion. Fresh frozen plasma to replace coagulation fractures is used. Now, cryopreps precipitates for fibrogen replacement are very important. Platelet transfusion is needed. Now, heparin may be needed if there is massive thrombosis and if thrombosis is predominating factor. Activated protein C may be required if there is septic shock. So this is in nutshell about disseminated intravascular coagulation. Next is von Willebrand's disease. It's the most common inherited bleeding disorder. Von Willebrand's factor facilitates platelet adhesion to each other and to damage endothelium. It also is a carrier protein for factor 8. The three forms of clinical presentation. Uh, usually, lab shows normal PT and PTT. Bleeding time is prolonged and von Willebrand's factor activity is low. Now, it's again of multiple types. One Type 1 is a mild form, seen in about 80% of the patients where they have mucosal bleeding. Type 2 is mild form, seen in 10% of patients, mucosal bleeding because of dysfunctional von Willebrand's factor as compared to decreased von Willebrand's factor in type 1. And type 3 is a severe form, is in the rest of the 10% of the patients, and the bleeding episodes resemble hemophilias, and these patients do not have any detectable von Willebrand's factor. Treatment is by giving desmopressin, which stimulates endothelial cells to secrete stored own Willebrand's factor 0.3 microgram per kilogram IV or subcutaneously over 30 minutes every 12 hourly is usually the preferred modality of choice. Factor 8 concentrates may also be given for type 1 or type 2 and 3 and cryoprecipitate bags also help. Now anticoagulant toxicity can happen is rare but can happen. Warfarin is treated by giving white meat K, fresh frozen plasma, prothrombin concentrates or recombinant factor 7. Heparin toxicity can also happen is treated by protamine sulfate or low molecular weight heparin which can cause partial reversal.
Then you can also have fibrinolytic hemorrhage where we give cryoprecipitate, fresh frozen plasma, platelet transfusions, aminocapric acid, and recombinant factor 7. So obviously liver failure can cause bleeding as most of the coagulation factors are synthesized in liver. So vitamin K, fresh frozen plasma, platelet, desmopressin, and cryoprecipitate are all used depending upon which is the presenting uh, complaint. Now, renal failure can also cause bleeding, especially hemodialysis provides transient benefit uh, for platelet function 24 to 48 hours. Desmopressin can also be given. Platelet transfusion and cryoprecipitase can also be used. Now, some of the drugs can inactivate platelets and cause bleeding problems. For example, amino salicylic acids, we should just continue discontinue the drug to provide relief and then platelet transfusion may be needed and desmopressin can also help in some patients.